Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in today. It is a beautiful day in Seattle. I have to tell you this every time I do a show because from the past, when I've always been here, it's been raining. But I can tell you this, that since May, we have had some outrageous weather here in Seattle. So um, the trees are turning colors. Um, it's getting crisp in the air and fall is here. So I'm really excited to be in the Northwest during this time. It's been a very long time since I've actually been able to do that. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here in uh, Seattle, Washington. What's Your Story is a show and it is a video and you can listen to people that are courageous enough to tell their stories. And we don't judge here. Everyone's story is unique to them. As we listen, we can always decide if we have a piece of their story because I know that I seem to always have a piece of someone's story when I hear them talking. So it just shows you how we intersect in each other's lives. Part of the reason I do this is because I am very much about human connection. And the way the world is today with technology, sometimes we really don't even get a chance to see each other. We text or we call or we email and we don't even get to look at someone in the face. So that's why I do it the way I do it with What's Your Story, video and audio. I also wanna thank you so much for supporting me. I get emails from you. I get likes on uh, Kathy Bacon, What's Your Story Facebook page, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it because it sort of lets me know that what I'm doing and how I'm doing it is turning out pretty darn good. I love the way that you connect with my guests. I love the way you tell me that they inspire you. I really feel good about that, and if I'm doing that to just one of you, then I've really done my job. So if you want to see the videos uh, after today, not live, you can watch them on my YouTube channel, uh, What's Your Story Radio. You can watch them on uh, my Facebook page, Kathy Bacon, What's Your Story. You can also watch them on my website, which is www.kathybacon.com. You can see all my guests there, who's coming up, who's going to be joining us from week to week. So again, I want to thank you. It really means a lot to me. And today, I can't tell you how excited I am to have um, a woman on that I have known for quite a while. Our lives have intersected here and there and everywhere, and I'm really grateful for that. Uh, her name is Cody Teets. And in 1980, Cody Teets joined McDonald's as a crew member in Colorado. As vice president franchise relations, Cody is responsible for ensuing systems success by working closely and collaboratively with owner operator leadership bodies. And I'm going to have to ask her what all these letters stand for, but NLC, NSLC, OPNAT, and the Diversity Networks. And prior to this, Cody served as Vice President and General Manager for the Rocky Mountain Region, accountable for nearly 800 franchisee and corporate restaurants in nine states, representing over $2 billion in annual sales. So, we all know I've known McDonald's since I was a little kid, and it's not going away anytime soon. It is thriving right here, and I can tell you it's thriving in other countries because in Thailand when I was there, there was a McDonald's right across the street, and McDonald's, they had a figurine of McDonald's standing outside the restaurant, and he was doing this because in Thailand, this means welcome. Hello. And it was the coolest thing. In fact, I think I sent um, Cody a picture of it because it was just the, the coolest thing to say in McDonald's over in Thailand. She earned a bachelor's degree in marketing from the University of Colorado and an MBA in finance from Regis University while working at McDonald's. 
In addition to serving as a chair of McDonald's Global Women's Leadership Network, Cody is active in her community, serving not only on the board of Reg at Regis, but also as board treasurer for something that's very close to my heart, and that is Dress for Success Denver. She is proud of the opportunity she has had to make a difference for customers, employees, franchisees, and the community while at McDonald's. In April 2012, her experiences inspired her to publish her first book called Golden Opportunity, Remarkable Careers That Began at McDonald's. Cody skillfully, and I have to tell you this, it is skillful that she balances her professional and personal goals on a daily basis. Her highest priority is spending quality time with her husband, Dan, and their two children, Colton and Jackson. And I can tell you, you are going to want to listen to this interview and really be inspired. So without further ado, hi, Cody. Good morning, Kathy. It is still morning where you are and where I am in Colorado today. Yes, it is. It is. It's morning. It's so great to see you again and your smiling face and just it's so interesting reading your bio because we think we know people pretty well. And then when we start listening and hearing about all the things that they've done to support not only themselves and others in the community, but just what you've done as far as nonprofits go and then writing a book. <laughs> I mean, I remember when you were talking about it a few years back, and now it's out and it's come to fruition. It has. It's, um, I always say it's been a journey, and I believe life is a journey. And I have to say that on the book part anyway, I started thinking about it 10 years prior to actually um, putting pen to paper. But I, I must say one of my favorite sayings is, you never finish what you never start. And that kept playing in the back of my mind uh, as a friend inspired me to write the book. And I'm like, yeah, I just got to sit down and write it. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But it's one of those life goals that I've always had. And I can say um, it was a learning experience. It was at times a frustrating experience. But I feel a lot more people are more knowledgeable now about uh, the opportunities at McDonald's than they once were. I think you're right. And, you know, I haven't read the book yet. But when I think about your journey, I mean, you started as a crew member and look at where you are today. I mean, that just shows people that the ability to grow within McDonald's and the company is really an incredible thing. And I don't think we think of that. I don't, you know, we go to McDonald's. I remember going to McDonald's as a kid and just thinking, you know, this is what they do here. They, they make hamburgers and I get to come here and eat and it's really great. But it's so much more than that. So we'll talk more about that. But in today's business world, people don't stay in companies very long. Right. And what has kept you at McDonald's this long? Yeah, and, and as you were saying that, you know, I think about the hundreds, maybe even thousands of folks who started at McDonald's restaurants and then came up to officer level, whether in the company or doing something else. But um, with today's folks, right, it doesn't seem like there's the loyalty to stay with one company uh, for a long period of time. So it's really important to take what you can and learn as much as you can while you're there. But to your question, what keeps me there? The main thing is that no two days are ever the same. I, I have to say, you know, whether you're dealing with uh, marketing or finance or building a new restaurant or developing people, no two days are ever the same. The challenges are never the same. But, but most importantly, it's I've had an opportunity to learn so much, uh, to grow as an individual through the classes they teach, through um, they helped fund my MBA, which I'll forever be appreciative of. And then um, probably most important to me is the ability to train, develop, and mentor so many other leaders and help those folks achieve their goals. So, um, you know, it, it's been a fun ride. It's it's been you know rocky like any other career it's had its ups and downs um good thing more ups than downs but uh definitely all those experiences of what kept me there for 30 plus years yeah that's a long time cody and for them to not only support you as and growing within the company but supporting your education as well i mean 
that's really a fantastic thing. And and I can tell you, I worked in corporate for a while when I was younger, and they, you know, they they supported all of that. But a lot of companies don't do that anymore. So that's a big plus. Yeah, and I'm not sure. Um, we even have education opportunities for the folks who work in our restaurants now. After 90 mm -hmm. days, they can get tuition assistance. They wow. can all assistance in getting their GED. So um, it's a core value of McDonald's, which is matched up nicely with one of my core values, which is education and giving back. So uh, I think there's a lot more to the story than people are actually aware of. I think I think you're absolutely right, and um, it's great to have you here and sort of touch on some of those points for people that don't know. Um, who inspired you to write the book? Yeah, so I have a, a friend from high school. Her name is Gina Otto, and Hi. she wrote a book, a children's book called uh, Cassandra's Angel. And after she had written the book and she was going through the PR and the publicity side of it, which is a lot of work, and she right. self-published, so it took a lot of her personal time, energy, and resources. Uh, you know, I kept saying, you know, one of my goals in life is to write a book. I just don't know what I'd write it about. And Gina had worked with me at McDonald's at one time. I think we were both probably 16 or 17 at the oh, time. Oh, wow. And she says, you know, you've been there so long. McDonald's is such a community. Um, why don't you write a book? And, you know, it's one of those things that kind of nod at me at the back of my mind. No, yeah. I'm not book maybe I should write a book what would I write a book about um, so ten years later actually from the first time Gina planted the idea to actually the book being published but I'm really happy I did it I bet I, I just can't imagine the company must feel so good about it as well because you highlight in your book people that have been able to come up through the ranks and talk about that so I mean what a plus for McDonald's to hear from someone that actually went up through the ranks, you know? It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Thank so you, Kathy. what motivates you? You're so motivated. You're such a motivated individual. Yeah, sometimes my uh, my husband would probably like me to come down a notch. He says I have two speeds, really, really fast or probably asleep. <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes I feel myself I need to to monitor that a little bit, if you will. But it's um, an inner drive, an inner passion, and I, I, you know, what, what, what is it that motivates me? I get motivated watching other people succeed. I get motivated when I have a goal and I accomplish that goal. I get motivated listening to music, especially music that has a story and a theme. Um, I remember one of my favorite songs, Barbara Streisand, uh, "The Woman in the Moon," and it's just telling a story about, you know, women and how they're kind of beat down a little bit oftentimes in life, but how they rise above it, which is a lot about what Gina's book, Cassandra's Angel, is about as well. So I don't know. I, I'm just so driven, and sometimes I feel like it gets a little out of whack, um, <laughs> but I, I, it's an internal, just a flame, a desire. I don't, I don't know, but I feel motivated 90% uh, of the time. <laughs> and, you know, motivation sometimes we become motivated, but sometimes we don't always succeed when we're motivated. And then we get a little out of sync with that. I know a lot of people I've met along the way said, well, I tried to do something, didn't work out, so you know, I'm not gonna do it anymore. How do you feel about that? I mean, motivation comes, don't you believe, from succeeding just a little bit each time. It adds up to something bigger. So how did you hold on to it? Because I'm sure that not every single time you've tried something, you always succeeded, right? We always have to learn from what we do. Oh, I'm pretty good at throwing my own pity party you can <laughs> when things don't work out as I had planned. But, um, and I can't remember the name of the, the gentleman with the quote, but never, 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 never give up. And so it might take me 48 or 72 hours after something didn't go my way before I can really listen to that and, and reflect on it and give it another run or give it a, another run in another way. Or oftentimes it's a little bit of just. Uh-oh, where'd you go? Come back. <laughs> I'm back, sorry about that. Can you see me? Um, I can't see you. Let's see. There you are. Okay, sorry about that. Um, no so, worries. So just how do you take another run at it and not give up? And and I probably from a psychology class when I went to CU in Boulder about 
creating a goal board or people call them dream boards, sure. you know, and I did that with five goals that were on there when I was um, probably 19 years old. And I'm happy to say the five big ones have all been accomplished. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in the process of creating the next dream board because I'm a big believer that you have to tell people what you want because others will help you succeed. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, but it, it's not it's not always a, a motivated day. Um, I'm right. human like everybody else and we have our ups and downs, but right. those small wins create confidence, which is very, very helpful. I think you're absolutely right. And I think people, you know, sometimes think if they, you know, start out to do something that it's going to happen just like that. As we know, it doesn't always happen just like that. And people sort of get down on themselves and then they, the motivation just goes down to nothing. And so it's good to hear you say that in fact, you know, motivation comes from just little baby steps along the way that you make for yourself. And it's kind of like that with confidence too. Once we start succeeding in little ways, those things sort of come into play for us. So I think from what I've seen from you, <laughs> you maybe have had, and I'm sure you had like all of us, a few little delays, but you just keep going. You just keep going and you don't give up. And I think that is a really important thing to remember for all of us is just don't give up. Yeah, it, it, it is, it's hard. It's hard. And, and, you know, I don't know how many people who are watching are checklist people, but even, you know, some people hate checklist people. So let me say it that way too. But even just having a checklist and completing it builds confidence because you realize that you were persistent, you followed through, you were able to get it done. And it brings a level of self-satisfaction that in the long term does build confidence because otherwise life happens, right? And we can get right. pulled so many different angles we forget and not purposeful, but it's life. <laughs> That's right. It is life and does happen. But, you know, we're all put here to figure this out and decide how we're going to live it. And we are kind of the director of our lives, so to speak. So what role does philanthropy pay, play in your life values? Yeah, so um, I have to say I didn't really become philanthropic till probably my mid-30s, and it wasn't a lack of desire. It was a lack of time, um, children, career, relocation, um, school. Um, so once I got to a point where I felt some of those um, things were taken care of, I've, I honestly believe it's important for anybody who can to give back. And um, I've been very blessed uh, financially, career-wise, education-wise. And so, you know, I grew up very poor. Um, actually, we lived on food stamps and we uh, shopped at the thrift store. And when I wanted to go to college, you know, I was going to be the first person in my family to go to college and we didn't have the money to go. So I think the two things that have really shown up for me in the philanthropic area are um, how do you give back to women and single moms? And how do you give back an education for people who really want to go to school but can't afford to go to school? So I feel since I'm in the position now, I have a responsibility to give back and enable and empower others. And so um, through the organizations that I both, I've both i most been in contact with, Dress for Success and now Regis University, nice. uh, those play out well. And I'm, I'm looking for the next thing, and hopefully I can bring my son along with me. Oh, that's awesome. Because your son, is, is he going to college? Yeah, my 19-year-old's uh, going to Colorado Institute of Art to study. Oh, my gosh. Graphic design. I had to think about that a minute. And, um, you know, but I, it's just I have a lot of friends who've done things with the Hunger Project. Yes. And I think it would be a good experience, a bonding experience, right, especially after working as much and as often as I do, especially away from home, to see if we could do that together. And, you know, maybe build a different relationship about a common goal, but also for him to see that not everybody has been as privileged and um, grows up like we do here or how the U.S. does, as a matter of fact. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I think I've always believed in that. And I just, it seems we've lost a little bit of it along the way um, because, again, every, like you say, Everyone's so busy, they're working, their kids are in school, they might be traveling with their job, they might be doing all these things. And so to connect and get that going in a family is hard sometimes. But it is 
manageable and what you're going to do now. And I, I have to say that youth, we need them. We need them so much. And everything that they're learning today that we never learned technology-wise, um, just having someone in the family that's going to go into that field, that's going to be fantastic. So, you know, it, it, when you say privilege, I think a lot of times kids take that for granted a little bit and don't really realize that they're privileged until they go to a food bank or until they serve a meal. You know, well, I have to be honest, I didn't realize I was poor until like seventh grade when somebody told me I was poor, right? Oh. And now, cool. So it's one of those things that that environment, um, good or bad, rich or poor, healthy or, um, or not healthy in a family environment, that's what you know, and that's all you know, right? right. Good or bad. It's so true because you know, we, um, I think at an early age, I learned it, but it wasn't from my family. I believe that I learned it because I went to a Catholic school and we all wore uniforms. Mm -hmm. So you didn't know who was rich or poor. And one of my best friends, I didn't know that she was poor until I went to her house to stay overnight. And she lived in a trailer house. And I remember walking up to the door thinking, she lives here and I felt very uncomfortable, but then I had to remember that she was my friend and none of this stuff really mattered, right? right? And I think at that age, I started to think about the fact that, wow, you know, not everyone has what I have. So I need to be more compassionate, more kind and more giving to others, you know? And I, it's so great too that you learned it as well because now you can show your son what it's about, you know? Right. And, you know, the, the thing when I think about school, right, and youth and how it frames you, um, growing up in Denver, I lived in a neighborhood where they were actually starting busing for segregation because they thought the public school was keeping, you know, the whites and the Hispanics and the blacks um, segregated. But as I look back on that, that was one of the best things that ever happened in my life. Um, and I know even going back and looking at some of the articles in the newspaper in, in those time um, frames, early 70s, the opinions were such that it wasn't necessary. And there was even a lot of hatred around what was happening. But I, it taught me to think differently about people of color, to think differently about myself as a white individual. and um, as as I've grown through school, through working, I have to say that I believe that's one of the biggest benefits because, you know, some folks have to learn diversity as they got older. And awesome. I feel like I had an opportunity to learn it, you know, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Yeah, same, same. And I, I'm really grateful that I have because I don't see a lot of my people in my family really thinking about it. And when I talk to them about it, it's almost like it's a foreign language to them. And I'm thinking, Gosh, maybe for Thanksgiving, we should all go and, uh, you know, hand out some food at, at a local shelter. I mean, my goodness, it's just, it, we are all one. And so if we can sort of operate in those, in that thinking, then giving back is really not a big deal anymore, you know? Yeah, so. it's interesting, all the stuff that happened in Houston, right? And everything ah. Going on, I would just kind of say with the the race battles, and then when the hurricane came, yes. that didn't matter anymore, right? Where they were people, there were people helping people and ensuring everybody had what they needed. And it's unfortunate that it takes something devastating to bring it together. Yet, it was um, phenomenal to see. And I guess while there was those bruises along the way, it, it taught me a lot as well growing up. Yeah, I think that's, I, I, it's really true. I, I think if I could change anything in the world and I could, you know, wave my magic wand, it would be that we act like every day there's a tragedy event and we treat people with kindness every single day because man alive, we just don't know what's going on in people's lives. We just don't know. And 
a smile, an opening of a door, all those little things just make such a difference in people's lives. And, and, you know, you've done so much for Dress for Success, which of course I love. And you yes. just, you've done so many other things along the way too, Cody, to show others that, you know, to give back is attainable and we all have it within us to do it. So thank you for that. <laughs> I could do it any other way. Yeah, I know. I, I feel the same way, but I know not everyone does. And I just hope someday, somewhere along the line, we can't make everyone's journey like ours, ours, but I hope some way along the way that people will get that in their mind, that just giving back a tiny bit, man, doesn't it make your heart just grow so big? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you are very confident. From the moment I met you, you oozed it out, okay? You were, you've always been very confident. And so how, have you always been this way? What, what got you here, Cody? I mean, what did? I laugh about it because in uh, my own brain, I'm far from confident, right? But folks have said that to me. Um, some folks might say I'm the oldest child, right? So my mom doted on me more. She gave me more responsibility. Therefore, it created a confidence. But I remember when I um, went to high school, I, I switched from the Denver Public Schools to Douglas County and um, or Jefferson County rather and right. I was not confident at all I was not confident when I got my first job um, I think you know if I just had to say why why I think it's because I tried a lot of things and I'm persistent so it might take a minute but um, I remember at one point being coached when I was new to McDonald's from moving from a franchisee to the company mm -hmm. that I needed to talk more because I was too quiet. And my whole family would tell you, Cody, quiet, never. Um, but again, that confidence wasn't there yet. I was in a new environment. I didn't know what I should or shouldn't say. I think as um, we get older, though, what's nice is we don't worry as much about what we should or shouldn't right. say. <laughs> As long as we say it in the right way, because it's important that somebody say it. And um, but again, that's taken years of a journey. Um, and, you know, obviously, as humans, when people tell us we did a good job or when we feel that self-satisfaction, that all helps. Um, but I wish I could say that, you know, from the minute I get up in the morning, it's like, wow, I'm a confident person. It doesn't always play out that way. <laughs> <laughs> but we're human. Right. We're human. And, you know, I see people struggling all the time to say, oh, I, I thought I could do it and I couldn't. Well, and, you know, and just so many people lack that confidence. One thing that I remember and I have to share it because I, I just talked about it with someone is that a dress for success when people come out of the out of the dressing room. And these are women that have come in with in their jeans and they've been given this outfit. And they've been given. Gosh, they, the shoes, the jewelry, everything. And they walk out to that three-way mirror and see themselves. All of a sudden, there is confidence gleaming in their face. And so, to me, it doesn't take much to look at yourself and give yourself a little bit of confidence. And it may be that you get up every morning and get dressed, put on your makeup, you know, whatever it is, and just look in the mirror. But yeah. confidence, like you said, comes from just taking those little steps. Well, and Kathy, you're being, so first of all, for those of you who don't know, who've never watched before, but Kathy started or restarted Dress for Success Denver, and you all should know that, and she's being very humble about it. And, um, oh. So I just want to make sure that I share that because it is a shared passion. But I think those women, to your point, when they walk out and see themselves in the mirror, yeah. it's like they're seeing themselves as a person for the first time because a lot of them have just gone through so much trauma and turmoil that a lot of them don't feel they're worthy anymore. And when they see themselves, they see a new them. And it is so I, uplifting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. And then, you know, it's true about confidence. I think it's all in how we look at it. You know, maybe some days things don't go your way, but if you really sit down and think about it, you can think about what you could do differently. And 
as a learning experience instead of failure. I mean, I really try not to say failure at all anymore. I always just try to say learning experience and, and how it brings confidence and all you've done through your life. I mean, Cody, I mean, you know, you, you're saying, you know, I was poor when I was growing up and now I have to take my son to understand what it means to be privileged. I right. mean, you have, I mean, you're an, the epitome of, I mean, don't stop. Just keep going. Keep trying. Keep striving. Yeah, persistence is <laughs> one of my stronger points, and sometimes I probably need to take a step back. Um, but I also think that's what keeps me me driven, right? So the the strength becomes the weakness, or, or so they say, in learning how to monitor that as appropriate for the situation. But yeah, um, I've been very determined and persistent, and in fact, when people tell me I can't do something, I generally want to work harder to show them that I can. Um, I believe all of us are bright and intelligent and we can learn. And as long as people give you that opportunity and take a risk, you know, people will thrive. Yeah, I think there's a motto that I try to go by and it's try everything. Yep. If you don't succeed, you don't have to do it again. You can do something else. There's always something to try and always something that we have the ability to be really good at. And um, yeah, I love that. I, I just, I really love that. So what is a memorable event from your childhood that impacted how you see the world? Because all these things that we're talking about, there has to be something along the way. Yeah, so I think there's um, two things, and they were about the same time, and, and I hate to say it as a woman, but they were both about clothes, okay? So <laughs> or, um, so that when I realized I was poor was seventh grade, and I had a shirt, you know, we, we got new clothes at the right before school started, right before summer, and apparently I'd been wearing this shirt that I liked too often, and, and one of the girls said, is that your gym shirt? And I'm like, no, why? She goes, because you wear it all the time. And um, you know, that's probably made me now never want to wear the same thing. To oh, mom. yeah. It was like, I remember, you know, talking to some folks about it. And, you know, even my mom saying, well, you know, we don't have as you don't have as many clothes as maybe some of the other kids. Um, and then the other one was, um, again, around clothes. I remember having just one pair of shoes and I wanted to wear a dress and I didn't have really dress shoes to wear with the dress. And um I would always sit on the aisle at church so I could watch the ladies watch, walk down the aisle getting communion. And, um, you know, it's just, it made me at that point, that yearning for whatever those things were that, and to me, they're very materialistic now as I look back. Yeah, but. but oh, um, made me realize that I needed more. And then when I was able to attain more, then I want to give back to people because those, those things stick with you. Um, yeah. And I think it also makes me um, more giving and also probably um, a lot more willing to spend time with folks and figure out what it is that they really need to get where they want to go. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Those <laughs> No, I know. It's funny. You know, when you're a kid, those things make marks on your soul when you hear those things or when you, and as a kid, you know, materialistic things, I don't even think that we even have that in our minds. So just having things, you know, that we didn't have, it, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you know? My son's closet, and he can't even wear all his clothes, right? So. <laughs> I know, see? <laughs> Well, when I, when we went off to Thailand, I had to, I could only pack enough in two suitcases. And I can tell you, it was brutal. It mm -hmm. was brutal. And still like, I don't have a lot of clothes because of that. I mean, I had to get rid of so many things and I was a clothes hound. But again, like today, as we get older, like you're talking about, we look at things a little bit differently. You know, it, it's not that big of a deal that I wore this shirt two days right, ago, right. you know? big deal. But when you're a kid, it's a different story. It's a different story when you're a kid. So yeah, I mean, when you're a kid, right, all you spend your life is trying to fit in when you're an adult, and right. you get into the business world in particular, or, or anything that's, you're looking to way to differentiate yourself. And so it's just such a um, microcosm. And you know, yeah. but it takes a minute to figure that out. Yeah. 
Well, I, I had to wear a uniform most of my life because I went to Catholic school and I remember moving to Seattle and going to a public school and I couldn't believe what people could wear. I mean, it was so foreign <laughs> to me, you know, I mean, I was like, because I look like everyone else and I, I don't know, I, I think then it bothered me, but it, it, today when I look back, it was a really good thing because we all, we all really just hung out with each other, no matter who they were. If we liked them, we liked them. It wasn't about what they had. So yeah, it's a very, very interesting that, that whole concept. Um, well, if you had to walk through the halls of a high school lately, it would be very, um, it's very interesting. Let me use that word to see what they're wearing to school. <laughs> I know, I can imagine. I can imagine how hard it is for boys these days. Oh my goodness. I mean, girls look like they're so much older than they are now. It's just, it's incredible. <laughs> so, it's a different world as they say, right? It is a different world. I think my mom said this too at one time. It makes you feel like you're getting older when you say these things, right? <laughs> oh, look at the kids today. Hmm, you know? And we so, heard that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we did. We did hear that before. As a leader, and you are a leader and influencer, and you are an influencer. What is it like to work with you and mm -hmm. for you? Well, um, so whenever I get somebody who comes to work within my team or like even in an organization, Regis, Stress for Success, mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really important question that they ask other people who work with me because I think it's super important that um, as a boss, as a business partner, as a colleague, right, I'm going to have things that are strengths, I'm going to have weaknesses, I'm going to have things that infuriate other people. Um, so I like people to just ask that question because then they kind of know what they're getting into. But when um, I think about that, I can tell you what I try to be, and then the folks would have to answer how close I come to actually doing that. But I, I really try to create a um, organization where open dialogue is appreciated and honest. It doesn't mean we're always going to agree, but if you don't feel that you can come in and say what you need to say, uh, we're never going to be our best community of work, of um you know, in the schools, et cetera, because people are going to hold back and then they're going to quit sharing their great ideas. Um, the other thing is I always find out what their goals are and, and how can I help them achieve their goals because it's different for each individual. And when people know that you care, then they, I think, become more loyal and they become loyal to the organization, they become loyal to the individual. And then I really work hard to make sure that they have those opportunities that will help them get that experience. So um, I've been fortunate to have folks, you know, be able to go from admin to marketing, you know, and, and, and in some companies they might feel that's never possible, or to go from uh, development to finance, you know, building new restaurants, all the construction, and now I want to be in the finance world, but it's really just helping folks, and then I also, I always like to encourage folks, because back to the confidence thing, we all lack it in some way. So when I see someone as a rising star, I, I try to tell them that because, you know, sometimes I'm seeing something in them they haven't yet seen for themselves. And then how can I help them? And I think when I look back at my career, that's what I've got the most um, self-satisfaction from is watching the leaders around me become better leaders. Some better than me in many cases, right? Because you fuel their inner um, desire and they're they're just doing great but um on the other side though i would just say i'm hold folks very accountable i think accountability is critical a lot of times folks think accountability is um, a negative i see it as a positive as well because if i hold you accountable and we can talk about it you're going to get better um and if i hold you accountable when things are going great you're going to get recognized and rewarded so without those measurements on both ends we can't be our best selves so um I would say those are the biggest things. And at the end of the day, you know, I challenge people to challenge me and, you know, say, what is the right thing to do here? I'm not always right. They're not always right. So if you take it out of the personal of what is the right thing to do here, um, we generally land in a better spot. 
That's awesome. And, you know, I, I just think to, for me, like, I was never someone that had to be in charge. I love being part of a team. Love, love, love it. Like love more than anything being part of a team. So to have someone like you as a leader or an influencer to sort of guide my way or lead my way and be so positive because, you know, there's so much negativity too in the world. So to have a boss or to have someone on your team that is always being positive and wants you to strive and be best. And I love what you said about how some people have exceeded you. And that just shows what a good leader you are because if you can make other leaders feel good about themselves and be better, wow. Well, and I've learned a lot from people I've worked with, right? They've made me better. I think that environment of open, honest discussion has enabled them to make me better. Yeah. I really, really, really love that. And I, I, yeah, I open dialogue is the only way to go. It just stops communication is, this is my favorite thing. Communication resolves all problems. It just does. It just does. And so in a, today's world, sometimes I think it's hard to get people to talk. They'd rather email you or they maybe would rather text you. So how do you deal with that? I mean, especially with a lot of young people coming into um, the organization. So um, McDonald's has a, a great program. They have a, a young professionals network because there's not all the folks like me who, you know, come in in 30 years. Um, we're also actively and purposefully um, trying to bring some youth into the organization. So, but when you, elect, we have a reverse mentoring program, right? So um, I was, blessed to have a, a reverse mentor, Tim Leiterio, and he was in finance. Um, probably, I don't even know, Tim, if you see this, if you're even 30 yet, but ah. anyway, he was able to show me some things around technology. So even like you're doing right here with this blue jeans meeting, yes. this way of the future. I mean, I don't need to um, sit in the ch chair over there. I can see you and I can see your facial expressions and we can talk. Um, when people text me, if it starts getting heated, I pick up the phone and call them because I'm wondering, am I reading this wrong? Because you can't tell the emotion or the intention. So I, I call. Same thing on email. Um, because a lot of times now with email, people think it's like text and you get a one sentence response. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe I needed more than that. So maybe I didn't ask the right question. Um, but then you just pick up the phone. And I, I think as we continue um, this business journey, um, this societal journey, if you will, that we're going to just have to challenge ourselves, like you said, with the connections. And, you know, I um, spent a lot of time in Chicago and I would FaceTime my kids. I know folks who FaceTime their kids every day. Um, some my kids like it. Sometimes they don't. I kind of wonder what they're doing. They want to answer. But um, I think we have to leverage that and allow um, the systems and the policies and processes to evolve and be willing to be forever learners ourselves. Right. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I think it's possible. I really do. I think it's possible. And, you know, you can't fault the young people that are coming into this world now because of how technology is, but you can show them other ways. And that's a really great thing in any company or any business. So, Whoa, what does the next 90 days look like for you? I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's that exciting, but um, one of the really great things about working at McDonald's with the, with the company side is that every 10 years, you get an eight-week sabbatical. So I'm going to take my sabbatical, my time off, the rest of this year, and um, I'm really looking forward to what I'm going to say is probably be my first stress-free Christmas holiday season in about 30 years. I won't have to argue with my kids that we have to put the tree up today because it's the only day I have. Um, we could probably even take the whole week if we want to put up the tree yeah. and the decorations. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm, I'm thinking about taking a um, public speaking class back to this forever learner. Um, even though I do it um, and I do okay at it, I always want to be better. better. And I really want to look into this opportunity um, to do something, like I said, with my son. And I have to, um, you know, do some research on what that might look like now or in the future. And, 
you know, I, I'm a big believer, and some people might think this is too spiritual, but I'm a big believer in purpose-driven life. And I'm really hoping to take some time and decompress and say, okay, so, you know, you're too young to retire. You've made great strides with McDonald's, but what is it that you really want to do or what do you want to be remembered for? And that may or may not be with McDonald's, but I have to just, you know, take some time and really ask myself some inner thought provoking questions. So um, that's what I'm doing. Now, I will tell you after just, you know, starting this a, a a couple of days ago, I'm having to tell myself to stop because I've already put too many things on my to-do list, which will not allow me to decompress. So <laughs> I, I'm already trying to figure out the balance. Yeah, I bet. I understand. And it it's so true that, you know, I read the book, The Purpose Driven Life. It was a great book. And it doesn't matter what you believe. Those core teachings can apply to any of us which is a really wonderful thing. Right. So um, to be able to sit back now and breathe for a minute, because we don't do that when we're working, 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 and just really believe that you will get those answers of what to do next, because all of your experience from McDonald's can actually roll into so many other things. So, I mean, that's the beauty of it. And the just the people I think the uh, people I know inside and outside McDonald's, people I know in the community, and having worked in Chicago the last couple of years, the people I've met in Chicago and that um, those circles of influence, if you will, they've just broadened. And again, those are all benefits. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. I think that's awesome, Cody. I I know that whatever you do, you'll be very successful and. And it, I'm just, I'm just grateful to know you, and I'm grateful that our paths crossed along the way. I never believe that that is not by accident. It's always by accident. And you know, you're, you've just been a driving force in so many things that you've done throughout the years that I've known you. So, um, and I know that motivation has played a big role. And so now that you're sort of looking and changing and trying to decide. Mm -hmm. how will motivation play a role in that? Because for me right now, when I think about your job and what you've been doing in the past 30 years, I'd be wanting to go, oh, okay, let me just relax for a moment. <laughs> That's what I should probably be saying. Um, <laughs> but, and I should relax. I mean, so you're exactly right. I should relax. And, and maybe, you know, my husband's right. I don't really know how to, I'm, have these two speeds and finding that uh, middle one. So, you know, a lot of folks, I've never really tried meditation. Maybe I should. So it'll bring mm. you down a level and help me yeah. power it. Um, Cause I know you can't do everything with the same level of passion and intensity. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to say it's probably going to be hard for me, but it's probably a skill I need to learn. Right. And that, and that's, it's all happening the way it's supposed to. Right. I agree. I, there's so many skills that I'm trying to, bring into my life just because as we get older there's different things that affect us in different ways and one of them is journaling you know i've never been able to journal very well because i can get from from here to here no problem it's from here to here that i have a problem and you know i'm really trying to sort of take that on um you talked about meditation meditation is a amazing thing and it took me so long because like you i couldn't quiet my mind i just and when you read about how you're supposed to meditate and how you're supposed to do it, throw it all out the window. Don't listen to any of it. Just sit in quiet for as long as you can and let it happen. Because before you fall asleep, happens. right? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you. Well, if you fall asleep, then you really meditated yourself into a lovely place, <laughs> right? You're supposed to fall asleep. See, I don't even know. <laughs> oh, I love it. I really am just so grateful that we had this time together and um, I know whatever you do in life, it's going to be spectacular. And, and not to say that, you know, I don't want anyone out there to think, Oh, Cody is just never going to fail because she's already told you that she has. Okay. Yeah. And so don't get that in your mind that she's going to do everything perfectly now. But as we all know, if we look at our experiences, 
they can roll over into so many things, which is what you're thinking about now. Right. And I would say, you know, I always like to, you know, leave a, a meeting or a session like, you know, so Kathy, what do you need from me? And I mean that in a way that, you know, I help you, you help me. And um, so if there is anything ever, I just want to make sure that you know to reach out. I know you're in Seattle now. I'm in Colorado. I used to be in Seattle. Love it there. Beautiful. Um, so, but, you know, it, especially with technology, we can leverage it so much more than we do. And yes. you just let me know. I will. I I absolutely feel so comfortable saying this. I really adore you. And I really love you for all that you've done in the world. And from the moment I met you, you were engaged. You were there. Um, and there's one thing about you that I want everyone to know. And that is you're a very good listener. And so when someone speaks to you, someone talks to you, you really listen. And I can't tell you how much that has meant to me over time. So if people want to get a hold of you, Cody, I'm just sometimes people do, and I put it on my website. Is it best just to find you on Facebook and just send a little message? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple ways. Facebook is one. I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. I'm Twitter. Um, you know, I have a website for my book. Oh, good. Um, so, you know, any of those things, but, um, you know, on the listening, let me, let me just say this. I am not always a good listener and I appreciate you saying that. And if my husband was watching, he would probably be laughing <laughs> and, and maybe it's just at home, you know, we're not as good listeners with our children and our spouses. Cause we think we know what they're going to say. So right. I try hard to practice it every day. So um, good or bad, I surely have not perfected it. <laughs> yeah, but you, you know, it's funny what other people find in others, you know, like something you find in me, I might not see, like you said, you know, we might not find what other people think in us, but right. we do exhibit it, you know, and that's why I've said it. I mean, you've always been a good listener. For me, I was always a good talker. And over time, I've learned to be a good listener and that's why I do this because um, there's so many great stories like yourself that uh, have come forward and, and really inspired me and I need inspiration every single day of my life. I need to be inspired. So thank you. Thank you for that. And, and I'm, I just want to say to all the folks who might be listening or listen later, um, take a look at Kathy's uh, web page about her story and I know she'll share it but I, there's some amazing people I know who would be great um, guests on your on your series and they would add a lot of value to the listeners so I, I would offer up any of you folks who know me and you'd want to get in touch with Kathy let me know how I can help as well yes I would love to and that's always an open door to me I have guests till the end of November and I'm taking December off and you. then I know, and then January will start up and sort of relaunch some new different things. I'm going to probably start some forums because as you know, because you know about blue jeans, you can have up to 25 people on here. So it'd be mm -hmm. nice to get some topics together and then invite influencers and leaders to come on and talk about these different things. So there'll be a lot of changes in the new year, but I can tell you this. If you know of anyone that is interested, please just contact me. Um, I will give you the information that you need um, and we can just go from there. So I just, I, I so appreciate you be, being on today, Cody. I, I really, it, it just was great to speak with you and hear about um, how McDonald's has sort of taken you on this journey and how you're not afraid to journey off and just do something else if that's what it is too. So it's a really wonderful thing. So thank you for that. Well, and thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate the um, invitation to join you. I really do. Oh, I, and thank you all that joined in today. If you didn't join in during the live broadcast, I encourage you to come onto the website, www.kathybacon.com. I encourage you, you can find it on Cody's Facebook page. I'm going to share it there. I am going to share it all over town. Okay. <laughs> okay I think <laughs> no, you, <laughs> they will know who Cody Teets is. I can tell you that. So again, thank you all for joining us. And thank you so much, Cody, for being my guest on What's Your Story Radio.
Okay, take care, Kathy. Talk soon.